Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. Our first Patreon goal is 100 Patreon subscribers. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait. For more information on our Patreon, please go check it out in the episode description down below. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have a really cool guest on. Uh, his name is Corey Mitchell. Uh, he's from Smith Mountain Lake. And, you know, this is something I really like to do with the show is it's not just about, again, I said this a couple of times, but it's not about the pros and the glamour. It's also about the people in this community, in this area, whether you're a guide or a farmer that's lived on a river your whole life for th- like three generations, uh, or, or if you're if you're just someone that is really passionate about fishing and just wants to give your two cents. And, and Corey, I feel like you, you fit perfectly into so many of those slots here. And I just want to say thank you so much for for agreeing to come on the show. No problem, man. It's, it really is a pleasure to uh, to join you. What what, what kind of, like, t- tell the people at home kind of what got you into this and, and where are you located in, in the greater DMV area? I am uh, just outside of Roanoke, uh, about 50 minutes away from Smith Mountain Lake. Um, I got started fishing just kind of how a lot of people through my dad um started going with him he got a bass boat when i was about 11 or 12 and we started going to uh, smith mountain lake and i kind of just i loved i fell in love with it and uh then we fished a couple tournaments together and ever since then the fire's been lit and you know it's something I've, i've loved since that day it's such a great sport, and it's funny because we all have that that one moment of how we kind of got started in it. And, and and for you telling about your dad, that's like something that I think multiple people could say that that's happened to them as well. Uh, Smith Mountain Lake is such a unique lake with the community around there. And then you said you live about an hour from that, correct? Yep, correct. So, uh, how much do you actually get to fish it? Uh, I mean, with school and work, I mean, usually just on the weekends uh, in the summer. I get to fish it throughout the week some. We fish every Thursday throughout the summer, me and my good buddy Colin. We fish all the um, Thursday nighters they put on. But uh, usually about two to three times a week with with school and work in between. So it, it kind of gets a little chaotic at times. But, you know, we make it work. Dude, that, that's a lot. And that's actually probably how I found you is just through social media. Um, I, I saw one of your posts. I think it was from one of those tournaments. I saw that you got to consistent pretty fish it uh, pretty regularly. And the fact that you don't live that, I mean, an hour, that sounds like a drive for me where I'm located up in, in Maryland where there's no bodies of water super close. And so an hour, you know, it's not that bad if you're used to commuting, but I guess for some people I'd be like, oh, that's crazy. But yeah, it's it's kind of the norm if you live up in Northern Virginia. Yeah. And, you know, I guess I say I, I'm kind of grateful that I do live an hour. I mean, some people don't live within two or three hours of a lake. So just try to look at it and be grateful. I got three lakes within an hour of me, you know just kind of fishing when I can and just make time to do it. It's all you can do. It, it really is. And it, we kind of talked a little bit before the show started and I wanted to kind of get into this, that you haven't been a boater your whole life, correct? This is new. No. Yeah. This is, this is pretty new. I mean, I've been on a boat, you know, most of my life, but to be running the boat, running the trolling motor, all that is, is been within the last year. I mean, I, I ran the trolling motor some with my buddy Chase, but, you know, to have your own boat, it becomes your responsibility. And that's a big, that's a big learning curve, especially for me. It was, you know, because now everything on the boat equipment wise, that's your responsibility too. So, you know, if you get out there and your trolling motor doesn't work, well, now that's on you. It's your boat, you know, to try to figure it out. So it's been a, it hasn't been too bad as far as the fishing aspect, but as far as the responsibility and keeping up with the maintenance and, and things like that, it is a big curve. It, it really is, but it's just, dude, it is so freaking addicting. It, it is. I mean, I've, I've, I've been blessed with the boat that I had. I got it when I was really young and I've, I've taken good care of it. But, you know, they always say, you know, the old shtick is, you know, the, the, your favorite day is when you buy it and when you sell it. And there's so much maintenance that goes into it. But it, it's so worth the hassle to have it. It just opens up so many doors, friendships, and really just a lifetime of fun. Um, what's crazy, though, is you've been – looking at least just from what I saw on social media, you've done, you've held your own pretty well on Smith Mountain Lake for, for only being like the captain, sort of speak for such a short period of time. You've done very well. Yeah. You know, and I can say, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't fish much of the big stuff, but you know, I'm in a bass club. I've been in for 
four years now. Started with my dad, and then I fished with my uh, good buddy for a year out of the back of the boat. And so, you know, I've had fun fishing it. It's not big money. It's not big time with 10, 15 boat tournaments. But, you know, it, it's more about the the friendship that you make throughout the club. A lot of the people in my fishing club are have become some of my closest friends. And to have people like that around you, to me, if you're having fun, it is more important than winning any big tournaments. You know, I'm not in a rush. I'm still young. I'm not in a rush to get into anything big. You know, I thought about fishing the BFL, but I'm just trying to learn. You know, I'm not, like I say, I'm not trying to be some big stick. I'm just, I'm just trying to enjoy it and learn, especially in a club. I mean, that's the best way to do it. And, you know, I've had some success in the club, but, you know, like I say, it's nothing big, but it makes me feel good. And, you know, the guys in the club, to come shake your hand. You've known them for a couple of years now. It feels good to, to me, at least. You know, some people like the, the you know, the fame aspect, I guess, you know, to be a posted everywhere and in interviews. But that just hasn't been me. I, and I apologize if I if I didn't hear it. Uh, what, what club are you a part of? Uh, it's called Team Outlaw uh, Team Bass Outlaw. Fishing Club. It, it's a, like I say, a small club, just a group of guys that actually work for coca-cola they kind of started it and uh that's cool they actually the the connection is a lot of the people in the club fished in my dad and his dad's old fishing club they used to run seriously and so yeah there was a there was a period where my dad got out of fishing uh for about 10 or 12 years maybe not that long but you know there was a good gap and so it kind of just happened where we reconnected with all of them and we've been in a couple clubs but this one we found and we've you know we knew this was the one we wanted to be in. That's really freaking cool. Um, yeah, it, those local clubs are just so important. I've been blessed where I've recently finally found a club near me where I can just fish a Thursday nighter on the upper Potomac. Again, it's big slack. It's not like this. It fishes like the Ohio River. I mean, you catch seven to eight pounds, you're like, oh shit, we might catch a we might we might catch a check today. But it's close and it can scratch the itch. And I think that's so important where it costs twenty bucks to enter. It's not a thousand dollars. There's nothing crazy like that, and you can do it. Every, it gives you an excuse to get out in the water and meet people and, and and have those friendships. And you're right; that's so important. Yeah, it's been important to me. You know, as far as fishing goes, I mean, you, you learn a lot through just the friendship that you have. I've fished with a handful of the guys just on local lakes around here, and I've learned. I mean, I don't even know how much I've learned from them. You know, just just fishing with them, being a being a buddy. So it it um. It really, to me, that's what it's about more than winning a big tournament and all this money. It's really about the people you meet along the way. To me, you know, a lot of people see it different, but that's the way I see it. You know, with that with that being said, um, what are kind of like your plans and going forward right now? As of right now, I'm looking at, at starting at, at Liberty online. Oh, cool. Um, here soon. I was in, I was at a different school and I was doing a, I was doing a degree that I didn't really foresee myself doing. So, you know, I wanted to change it up. I want to get into the fishing industry, whether it's through fishing or advertising. I've always had a a niche for advertising and marketing. So I found a, I found a degree at, at Liberty that I like. So I think I'm going to start there and uh, maybe look at fishing some college stuff next year. That's kind of been something I've wanted to do since I was in middle school. I didn't have an opportunity to fish in high school at either school I went to. So to fish in college is something that I've, I've wanted to do. And I think that's going to be the goal. And honestly, that's the reason why I haven't jumped in many BFLs or, or try to go that route, because I feel like if I have a route to go anywhere in fishing through actual fishing, it's going to be the college route more than anything. That seems like more of my having a partner and that that's kind of more my fishing versus it's you versus 200 other people. Well, why do you think that is? Uh, I, f I seem to fish better with as like team tournaments. I always do better. I don't know if it's because it's just somebody to have out there with you or, or, or what it really is. But um, in, in another part is just going back to the whole friendship thing. I mean, a college partner you may have never met before can turn into one of your best friends for life. So, I really am looking forward to to kind of getting into that. And I know it has a bad name around it right now as far as college fishing goes. It's all kinds of controversy and, and whatnot. But um, like I say, I, I think that's just a small group of people that is doing things the wrong way. And I don't plan to do that. So I think I'll be I think I'll be fine with that route. Yeah, I, 
I wonder how it got the bad rap. Is it just because money corrupts everything? Because when I did it, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a lot of fun. I got it was it was free in the sense that you didn't pay big entry fees. You got to see new parts of the country. The only thing I wish they did more of was at the time was just more meet and greets with other teams, like so you could just talk fishing. But besides that, it was I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, you know, I think a lot of people are like you that have not everybody that I know that's done it has loved it too. I think down south, uh, Alabama, Georgia, you know, the schools that are really big into it, it becomes kind of kind of like football. I mean, where it's the school is going to pump a bunch of money into it, and I think a lot of guys, instead of looking at it the way you do, a lot of the guys look at it like. As soon as they show up to the tournament, their their head's already out of it as far as, oh, this kid's got $100,000 boat. This kid's got this. This kid's got that. Well, at that point, I mean, you've already lost anyway. If, you, if you're thinking that way when you pull in, I mean, you might as well put the boat back on the trailer and just head home because you're not going to – not going to you're not going to go very far. So I think, you know, the people that look at it like you do and, and I do and a lot of other people as making friends, seeing other parts of the country, learning, people that look at it that way – they're going to have a lot more enjoyable time. And I think that's kind of why it's got a bad rap is, you know, down South, it's almost like football where it, you know, it, it kind of runs the world down there. So you're going to have some controversy. And, you know, of course, like everything, a lot of people like to start drama. And I think that's kind of where you see the bad name. I mean, everybody I've talked to that's done it has loved it and saying exactly what you've said. So I, I think a lot of the bad rap just comes from, just a select few group of people that's either jealous or mad or, or whatnot. Kind of the same, similar to a live scope. I mean, the same people that give that a bad rap are the same people that are going to bash the kids that have it in college. So I think that's more what it is than anything. It is really sad because that is the case. The money, the more money gets thrown in there, the more sponsorships, it does kind of, I think, taint it a little bit. But that's just, that's, that's the way things are, sadly. But Liberty University, like why, why Liberty? Out of curiosity. Yeah. Uh, as far I, I like to do my schoolwork kind of online. I always have, you know, I was in high school during COVID. So I kind of, once we started doing online school, I kind of just, I liked it because I could do it in my time frame when I wanted to. I didn't have to be there at a certain time or, or what, you know, I could start it and finish it when I wanted to. So I looked and Liberty had a great online program. So, and also too, they had a degree, like I say, I, I want to do a communications degree and they, they had one that just totally fit what I want to do. And that's the main reason that, you know, I, I looked for hours at different colleges around the of world, really. And the only one that, that I found a degree that really stuck out to me was Liberty. And two, you know, that's the main reason. But also, you know, a lot of a lot of good sticks around the area have come through Liberty. I mean, you look at Jack Dice. I mean, I think everybody knows who he is or has heard of him. I mean, he is a, a hammer and, you know, he's fished for Liberty and they have a good team. It's already set up and going and healthy. And I think that would be a good, a good way to start, especially college fishing. It, it really is. Um, how, when did you graduate from high school? Is this your first year of college? Cause you talked about switching your degrees and really coming to an idea of what you wanted to do. I graduated in uh, 2021 okay. and I've been at a uh, community college in Roanoke for the last two years and I finished that up. So nice. And I just did general stuff. I didn't do any, anything because I just wanted to get my general study stuff out of the way. So I hadn't really looked. I, I know I should have been. I know mom's going to listen to this and, and agree with me there. I should have been looking at what I want to do, but I didn't. And so now I'm kind of in this weird position where I'm just now kind of figuring out what I want to do. I, I did I did community college to start with while I tried to figure out what I wanted to be when when I grew up. And so there, there's nothing, there's no shame in doing that. And honestly, it's a lot cheaper. We talk about college fishing getting more expensive just with all the other things that you have to do around it. It's the same thing with just generally school in general. It's getting way too expensive. Um, heck, life is getting expensive right now. But on that depressing note, I, I, we did mention something about Lake Moomaw, Smith Mountain Lake, all the lakes around you. You considered Smith Mountain Lake really like one of your home lakes. I cannot find anybody that wants to talk about Lake Moomaw and not about giving up the juice, but just like, what is it? It's just they they treat it like this this mythical thing. Is it? Do you have any knowledge of it? Yeah, you know, I, I fished Lake Moomaw a good bit just in the last two years. I mean, not every weekend, maybe a couple times a year, but you know, it's it's actually my favorite lake around here I, I love it um i think 
I, I don't think necessarily people are trying to hide it. I, I think a lot of people really don't know about it. I mean, it, it really is kind of a hidden gem. It is in the mountains, no phone service, complete middle of nowhere. Um, and, and to get to it is rough. I mean, it's it's all mountains. Like I say, it's literally in the middle of, of mountains. Um, I think that's a lot of the reason why. that. I mean, a lot of people really don't fish around here either. I mean, especially the Smith Mountain guys. I mean, very few of them actually go up there and fish. I, I think, like I say, I think it's just it doesn't get a lot of a lot of publicity, um, but it, it really should. It's it's a great lake. I mean, it's it's a uh, it almost reminds you of like a South Holston, a hmm. smaller version of it. The ri- you know it's got a it's a river fed. It, it's you know probably like every lake around here, man made dam, dammed it up, you know, all that deal. But you know it's really cool because like I say, it's got a river system and. If you go up in the river, you run into some large mouth, and then if you go if you fish near the dam at the bottom, it's small mouth. I mean it, it. I mean it's got it's got big ones in it. Like I say, I mean I think the state record is coming out of that lake sometime. I don't know when, but sometime. Small mouth state, state record. record. Small mouth. Yep, it'll, it'll come out of there. What's the biggest one you've caught out of there yourself? Uh the biggest one I've caught is is just under four pounds. But like I say, a lot of the one of my good buddies that fishes up there, he's. He swears to this day he lost the state record smallmouth at the boat, but he's caught some absolute tanks, six, seven pound smallmouth up there. I think one day, two years ago, he caught a six pound smallmouth and a nine pound largemouth in the same day. I mean, just unreal kind of stuff. It's so cool. You get those lakes. I think they're like that perfect size. And um, I just interviewed guys a couple days ago, whatever, John Odenkirk, who is one of the big, I guess, Hall of Famers, the Department of Wildlife Resources, and he talks about like the perfect lake sizes there. And what I love about podcasts and just having conversations is it's such a way like you go in with what you want to talk about. And then he says a throwaway thing. It's like, that's really interesting. And he talks about like big lakes don't produce the biggest bass. There's a perfect size, believe it or not. And it's like in that couple 2000 acre range where it's like, you're really going to get like the best size. And I think that's interesting because I've always thought like, okay, you want a hundred thousand acre lake to produce monsters. And he's like, not really. These 10,000 minus size lakes, they get, they produce big fish and no one thinks about them because they're not big enough. And I think that's what's so cool about a Muma or a Aquan Reservoir up where I am. You know, they're just the right size for this stuff. So I'm hoping next year to go explore Lake Muma a little bit just to see what that's all about. You really, you really, I mean, not anybody, I recommend to go up there, take the drive, go up there and fish it. Um, it's seen, it's kind of like your normal smallmouth it seems the colder the water is, the better, or at least your best chance of catching one. But like I say, I mean, I would put money that you could catch a 30 pound bag out of there before you go to Smith mountain. And, you know, I don't think the biggest lake produces the biggest fish either. I think, I mean, you look at most of the lakes around here that do produce the giant fish. If you look at the list that the uh, game department puts out every year, I mean, eight of the top 10 are lakes that you probably never even heard of, you know, whether it's, uh aquacon where you are or you know i think i think places like moomaw and and uh i mean philpot kinda but i really think that moomaw is going to be your next lake that blows up i mean it's only a matter of time before somebody absolutely just lights out up there and catches some giants how do you tend to fish uh lake moomaw is it have a lot of cover that you can visually see or is it a lot of stuff underneath the water schooling fish things like that uh, it really depends on the time of the year up there. I can say now that I've fished up there in all four seasons. Um, it about now or maybe June or July, depending on the rain we get, they'll, it's a drawdown lake. So just like South Holston, they'll draw it down uh, for winter pool. And if we don't get rain like this year, so I went up there last weekend and the water is already 13 foot below uh, normal pond which is really unusual. Usually that doesn't happen until about October. It's just because we haven't got any rain, but that kind of changes the way you fish the lake. I mean, just kind of like any lake. So, you know, you go up there and in November and the lake's drawn down. I mean, to me, when I went up there, I mean, I just put a crankbait in my hand and you can literally start at the boat ramp and fish around the whole lake with a crankbait. It's just mm-hmm. all rock. And uh, you can catch a great bag doing Sounds that. Like fun. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the schooling stuff was happening when I was up there. That's how we caught them. You know, with the lake being down, there's not a lot of cover on the bank anymore. A lot of it's either offshore or the fish are just chasing shad. So we were, we were catching fish, chasing shad. Just we would wait for them to, to blow up on the surface and throw our topwater over there. And most of the time within the first one or two twitches, they would hit it. 
And then, you know, so you kind of got the winter and like the weird time of year we are now that it's usually schooling or uh, once it gets colder, they'll kind of gravitate back towards the rock, the smallmouth will and large mouth too. But then in the spring uh, and early, or I mean, late winter, early spring into summer, the lake will be back to full pond. And uh, then a lot of the structures back in the water. So you can, you can fish lay downs. There's, there's a couple coves that have full of standing timber, just like Briary Creek. I mean, it looks identical, just full of standing timber and uh, you can fish that, or, I mean, there's lay downs and then that becomes kind of your textbook. Just, you know, you can throw a wacky rig and the lay downs or spinner bait or kind of whatever you want to do, but it, it definitely does change a lot throughout the year. I mean, if you go up there and, april versus september you're going to have a totally different experience especially with the water being down and like i say that kind of varies from year to year but and, and it can even flood too i've seen moomaw where it's up in the up in the bushes and you're flipping the texas rig like you do at bugs island so it's it's a lake that doesn't get talked about a lot but i think you know depending on your fishing style is when you should go up there you know i would i recommend if you like if you like the uh the shallow water stuff, go up there in the spring and I guarantee you, you'll have fun. And if you like using live scope and fishing for schoolers, then from now till February, that's when I would be up there uh, fishing. So it really is a cool place. It's crazy where I feel like nowadays with angling, people don't vacation places to fun fish as much. And guys, I could be wrong. Let me know in the comment section. It's usually about tournaments. Unless you're going to go to a place like the St. Lawrence, like some stupid, crazy place. People don't do that. And I think that's fascinating. It's like, why do people go to Kerr? I bet, I bet a lot of money. It's not because the fishing is amazing. It, it's, it's because there's tournaments and the Smith makes sense. Smith in the springtime, makes a lot of sense. It could be good there, but a Lake Muma or Aquan Reservoir, places like that, where you can't, you don't have tournaments really, but they'd be fun to fish. And it's a shame because I feel like people don't do that anymore. It's like, I'm going to vacation here because it, it would be fun to go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm with you. I've listened to previous shows. I'm definitely with you on the Drain Bugs Island. I'm I'm on that train. That place is awful. I don't know how people like to fish it. I don't understand why you would go there. It's it's uh, <laughs> that lake is terrible. Um, and I think I think you're right on. And that kind of relates back to the why you never hear about Moomaw is because there's no big tournaments up there. So a lot of the guys, once they know that, they're not fishing it. Like, you know, if there's no BFL coming to Lake Moomaw, they're, why waste their time? That's, you know, in their head, that's what they're thinking. But like me and, you know, like you, we like to fun fish, go up there and mm-hmm. have a good time. It's great for, for us. You know, it might not have the biggest tournament up there, but there's, I mean, and even lakes like that. I mean, Aquacon and Moomaw, perfect example. There is tournaments there. I mean, you look at like SB Fishing, he fishes the Jumbo Club there and yeah. they have 30 pounds winning every so tournament stupid. you never hear about it it's ever. so stupid the fish they catch out of there it's just and the average size i think they said right now the average is like five to six pounds is what you're catching that is that is like mexican border stuff on falcon or like on the side that's insane uh what they're pulling out of there and, and you brought up kerr and we brought up like moon mall like are do you want to be a local hammer or or do you want to like what, what is your envision for your fishing plan when it comes to that because i thought what you said before we started recording was was very interesting yep you know we've it's kind of an interesting thing to say and a lot of people probably don't like to hear it but i i don't want to be a a smith mountain lake hammer i mean and and i have nothing against the guys that are there's plenty they're great fishermen it doesn't take anything away from them the the chad green johnny martin uh billy coles chad and elliot pilson those guys are incredible what they do and they, they know a lot, but to me, you know, I like fishing different, different lakes, different areas. And, and I feel like to me, what helps me more than anything is to go to as many different places as I can, you know, like the Chickahominy river, you know, it's tidal shallow. It's completely different than anything that I've grew up fishing. And I feel like something like that, especially if I, if I do want to go to the next level in fishing eventually to me, in my head, no one had to catch 25 pounds with mountain every weekend is not going to help me get there. I need to, I want to be well-rounded. You know, I want to be able to f- go flip grass at the chick and then be able to go drop shot at Lake Muma. It, it's the country that we live in is very broad. As far as fishing goes, you can e- even state, if you want to break it down by state, there's completely different fisheries 
And to be good on just one, to me, is not something that I would like to do. I, I want to go to every lake. I might not catch 20 pounds, but if I can go to every lake and consistently catch fish, to me, in my head, that is more of a goal that I have than catching 25 pounds per weekend at Swift Mountain. I, I like the um, kind of being consistent, and that's kind of how I like to fish. You know, I'm not a big live bait or, you know, go out and catch eight pounders type of guy. I'm kind of a go throw a drop shot and catch 10 pounds and then we'll go from there kind of, kind of deal. Well, with that said, I mean, let's start with the Smith mountain like thing and then we'll branch out after your year of being able to run your own boat, fishing the Thursday nighters. What, what is the part of the game that you feel like you want to strengthen on Smith? And then we'll, we'll take that question. We'll branch it out to just in general fishing. Uh, I, for sure, uh, without a doubt, is, is learning lives go better. It's something I got to do. Um, you know, I know that not every fish gets caught with it, but I know in my fishing strengths, I mean, I, I'm pretty good at locking a, a crankbait and spinnerbait in my hand and going down the bank and, and catching them. But when it comes to the Mickey rig off of the end of a point, that's, that's where I start to struggle, and I always have. I, I've never really figured out the electronic stuff. I've caught fish with live scope. I mean, we've caught a bunch with it, but I just, when it comes to suspended fish out in the middle, that's something that happens a lot on Smith Mountain and Mooma and Philip. I mean, all the lakes around here. And uh, I just can't seem to get it figured out. I don't know if it's my live scope settings or I'm just not looking in the right areas or what I'm doing wrong, but it's something I got to get better with. I know it is, you know, you can only crank and throw a spinner bait so much. So, I really need to work on my, my offshore, not really point fishing. I mean, I, I feel like I'm pretty confident dragging a point or or that aspect of it. But these suspended fish that are just out there in nowhere land, that's where I'm like lost. It just goes over my head for some reason. Is it seeing the fish or catching the fish or both that you're trying to strengthen? I, I think it's both. I mean, just being able to identify okay, this is a bass that's catchable versus oh, yeah. not. And, and it's, I mean, it almost is like bed fishing. I mean, it, it is. <laughs> that's what it reminds me of these guys that are good at it. it. I mean, it seems like a lot of the good bed fishing guys can also look at live scope and tell you that that fish is catchable or not, or even tell if it's a bass. I mean, Smith mountain's got everything in it. So it's really hard to, I mean, you can usually tell a striper or something, but for me, I mean, anything other than that, it's hard to tell really what it is or, am I dropping down to a two pound crappy and wasting my time or am I dropping down to a four pounder? It's just hard to, for me, it's hard to tell. And I guess it just comes with time and maybe I'll get it one day, but that's what I guess what I got to work on for sure. That's so interesting because I mean, this is something I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about in an hour or two. Uh, Cause guys, as always, you know, this is pre-recorded and this will be, I think recorded the day of a, a live stream where we're talking about forward facing sonar. And I find it at the hardest part is, it, we're just talking about just purely understanding live scope is knowing when to use it and when not to. Um, when I first got it, I was glued to that screen no matter what. And I sucked because I didn't understand it and I was forcing it too much. And the longer the year went on, I've gotten better with it this year. I think most part because I learned to ignore it. It's like, I'll, I'll get data from it. There's bait in this area. There's not bait. There's no activity. There is activity. Should I stay longer? But the idea of like, I'm only going to cast to a single fish, uh, generally at the places I, I go, it doesn't set up for that. And I think that's one issue is social media shows off St. Lawrence or you know St. Clair, these places where it is perfect to drop on one fish. But if you're fishing a river that's 10 feet deep and they're stuck to the bottom, it's not, that's not what's going to happen. And knowing when to mentally, like, I'll keep it on to look around, but I'm still going to crank a crankbait. And then maybe I'll see one perfect little blob at the edge of a tree and I'll pick up a sink and fire to it. I think that's what's so hard is, is the guys that are really good at it know when to not pay attention to it versus me personally. That's where I struggle with is when do I really get dialed into this and when do I ignore it? Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of people's problem, even me too. I mean, it's even, even when you do see one at the end of a tree, I mean, to me, if I'm, if I am cranking or throwing a spinnerbait, a lot of times I'll just turn it off because if I do see one at the end of a tree, I feel like in my head, I'm, now I'm wasting time fishing for it when I could be 10 yards down the bank. So that is another thing. I mean, I think you look at like SB fishing, uh, Matt, he is, he, he's great with 
and he'll be going on the bank and then C1. It it's just, literally just looks like it's textbook. They'll just throw over to it, and now he's got a six-pounder that he caught that's just off the off the bank. And I've I just never been able to do anything like that. And maybe, maybe I need to leave it on, but, you know, and even in my head, too, if I feel like if I'm throwing a, a crankbait super shallow, I feel like I'm just I'm messing up the whole spot by pinging transducer, you know, off the off the rocks. I really think there's something to that. I've shot it at some fish and I feel like besides that, I just probably gave them cancer that when I hit them, <laughs> their movements change. And is it because of the trolling motor or is it because I hit him with a beam from 10 feet away? You know what I yeah, mean? I've seen, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen, I never believe that that stuff happened. I've heard the pros talk about it where you, the, the fish act all different when you pointed at them, but I never really believed it until I went to a lake that another lake doesn't get talked about probably for good reason, but it's uh it's Baloo's Lake in right above Winston Salem. It's a power plant lake. It's got spotted bass in it. That's why nobody talks about it. It's, it's full of spots. But we went down there in the winter time just because the water was warm, and I uh, was fishing offshore. And I w- I would see bass. We would catch them, and I'd point the live scope at them, and and no kidding, they would literally just swim straight to the bottom, hmm. so close to the bottom that you couldn't see them. And it didn't matter if they were in 10, 15, 20, 30, they would swim directly to the bottom I, and you would not see them again. I swear to God, these things are smarter than we give them credit for. I really do. Like, like, <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, they, you know, they, they are creatures that have to live and, and survive. You know, they, they know this stuff. I mean, a lot of people think they don't, and that they're just so stupid and easy to catch, but in order to survive, they have to adapt to this kind of stuff. It just, it's what they're made to do. It, it it really is. And then you said that was called Blues Lake? Yeah, Blues. It's uh it's about an hour and a half for me, right above Winston Salem. It's a it's a power plant lake and like I say, it's full of spots that I think a a four pounder in there is just would be unheard of. I've seen a couple of fives and sixes, but usually a, a ten to twelve pound bag is gonna is gonna win you some money at Blues. Blues Lake, North Carolina. Okay. B L U S. Oh wow. How far is that from you? Like, it's kind of well, it's about an hour and a half. Like, not, not too bad. E-E-L-E-W-S. I'm just going to show that uh, anyone that wants to go Carolina, see it. Guys that are listening I mean, on there's Apple, no tournaments Spotify, there that can catch one. But uh, and, and, yeah, having uh, this new curl like, is kind of fun to have. Because that's like, kind of like Lake Anna. B-E-L-E-W-S. Yeah, and that's why, you know, in the winter we were kind of struggling. We were going to go to Lake Anna, but then we figured out, okay, well, that's private. We can't. So this is the only lake that we could find close to us where it was a power plant. Yeah, and that's why, you know, in the winter we were kind of struggling. We were going to go to Lake Anna, but then we figured out, okay, Okay, well, that's why we can't. can't so mountain was about this is the only lake that we could find. Water there was close to us, where it was a power so plant, a big water lake that was public to fish. I mean, we were there in January, huh. and the water temperature on the mountain was about is too, 45, 45, 46, 46, and the water been there was summer, but I heard that it's so it's so a pack that can't even get on it with wake boats, and I don't know where they all come from. There's a few houses on the lake, but. Oh, wow. And the crazy it's part is, too, one of the summer, most interesting lakes I've been there this summer, but I've really heard that like it's water there. So I mean, packed, you can't people even get on it like Wake or Phil I don't know where they all come from. There's a few houses on the lake. They haven't seen clear until they fish. It's the definitely it's it one of the most interesting 10, lakes I've ever fished. And there's really nothing like it. The water there, I mean, if people think like Moomar or Phil or even Smith Mountain is clear, they haven't seen clear until they fish the blues. It is 10, 15, 20 foot visibility. It's It's unreal. What is the lightest line that you'll go down to? Usually I've fished with six before, but eight's about all I do. I mean, that's, that's what I just use normally. I, I really, for everything, I'm using eight pound if it's spinning rod. Um, I, I, I do go to 10 for jerk bait. I don't know if it makes a difference or not, but I mean, I, I could see how it does make a difference. And I'm sure some people think that I'm stupid for not going below eight, but I just, if I'm fishing around rocks and especially Smith mountain fishing around boat docks using six and four, that's, that's kind of that, that to me, that's just kind of sketchy. You're just looking to get broke off on a piling. Yeah. I think I've always wondered about pressure and how pressure is going to start affecting this, especially when you talk about forward facing center and catching fish where mm-hmm. I, if it's super clear water, I think that's the biggest thing. If you're super clear water, spooky fish, I do think it does make a difference. I, I, I don't know how much I, I think, at least for the smallmouth that I've been catching, going down to six and five, even sunline five. Uh, but I think, guys, here's a tip, power tip. At least I, I think this is a power tip. Um, buy specific line that's made to be leader. Don't just buy fluorocarbon that's your main leader. You can buy fluorocarbon. Different brands have it. It's called leader material. It's got way more shock, 
shock absorption for fluorocarbon compared to regular line. It's a little bit more expensive, but you'll be rewarded when you're going to five or six, seven pound tests, lighter than eight, generally speaking. It'll handle being tied on two ends with, with your tag leader and then to the hook. And then it's just going to be a little bit more forgiving when you set the hook. Um, but yeah, that's just my little tip for using that super light stuff. But I've always been fascinated to ask people because what they think finesse is and what they think their interpretation of it is. Yeah. I mean, like I say, I use eight pound, uh, Sunline sniper. That's what I've used Ooh. forever. Um, I, I've never had an issue with it breaking or anything like that. I, you know, I've used it frayed before on accident, not seeing that it was, and I've never had one break me off with it. It's just what I'm confident in. Um, I, well, they do make a, they just came out with a leader material like you're talking about. And even they've even came out with some that are tapered to start at like 10 pound ago, all the way down to like six on the same line. So there's definitely, um, and I think that some of the Japanese anglers have showed us that when it comes to the finesse side, we haven't even scratched the surface with that in America. God, no, dude. And it's who's winning the finesse tournaments. It's the guys from Japan. Mm -hmm. If you want, yep. if you ever want to be on the cutting edge, the guys, super simple advice here. If you ever want to be on the cutting edge of what's going to happen, Go on YouTube and follow as many guys over in Japan as possible. I know it sucks to have subtitles. Sometimes you don't, but just watch what they're doing and you can bet that that's going to be over here soon. The idea of figure eighting bass with your rod, it started over there. They were the ones doing the figure eights, which is so crazy. Uh, spy baiting, of course, jerk baiting. So yeah, don't be afraid to go over there and just watch a couple of those videos because you think it's stupid, but the hairy dice started over there and now you have this stupid little sugar cube thing that, that costs like 30 bucks on tackle warehouse or whatever it is so it, it's yeah. it's fascinating it works apparently but it's it's crazy yeah i haven't messed around with that but it is very intriguing to watch them i mean and some of them even uh they'll throw a ned rig with all kinds of strands sticking off of it and i'm not sure the reasoning behind it but obviously it works so you know you can't knock them for it no you you, you can't um and then with that said with smith and smith out lake let's let's branch out a little bit what part of your game outside of smith do you want to work on you mentioned you know different bodies of water tidal fisheries grassy fisheries is there something in particular you really want to work on i don't you know i haven't got the chance to fish much like grass you know i grew up fishing ponds you know a little bit you know, like during middle school and stuff, but to fish a lake with a lot of grass, it's something I haven't really done. I think, I mean, tidal fishing is kind of just, it's a lot of timing. I mean, I don't, I don't know how much you can really learn about it other than trying to find a spot that sets up right with the tide. I mean, it's totally different, but I guess if I could, it's just hard for me around here to do, but you know, to fish a lake with some grass and try to learn how to flip and like I, I, I've never flipped a, a mat or anything like that. I mean, it, it's a chick. It's not really matted grass like that. I mean, there's some, but it's not. That was what I thought it was before I went down there. And you get down there, it's still a lot of lily pads and cypress trees. And so to fish somewhere that has some hydrilla or mats or like true mats, I haven't been able to do it. I love. I would love to, and I don't know how I would fare doing it, but. It's just not many opportunities around here for me to do that. I've, I've heard Anna has some grass at the top. I'm not for sure how, you know, strong it is up there, like if, it, if it's a good population of grass or whatnot. But uh, I guess maybe Sandy River or somewhere like that is probably the closest thing I could do. But like I say, that, that's something I want to work on. But, I, I mean, it's almost impossible for me to do living where I do. So I've just kind of have to take it as I go. And if I'm on a place that has some, just go try it out and see what I think. That's all you can do. This really is all you can do. Um, what What are your plans for, for the rest of this year? Do you have any tournaments that you're trying to get into besides Thursday Nighters? Yeah, the, the Thursday Nighters, are, they, uh, they ended a couple weeks ago, but uh, I, I got a couple club tournaments left in my local club. We're going to the Chickahominy River this weekend, actually, and then I think we got two or three more after that. Uh, we do have a – for the, the Thursday Nighters, they're through USA Bassin. It's a tournament organization. They are having a – every year they have a regional tournament that you qualify for through the Thursday Nighters. So that's probably the biggest thing I got coming up. I think it's October, middle of October sometimes. So, and it's on Smith Mountain. So we'll, we'll, that's probably the biggest one. Uh, I'm hoping to jump into some more tournaments on Sundays up at Lake Moomaw. We just did our first one this past weekend, and we loved it. So hoping to get back up there to some of those. I mean, nothing really big coming up until, you know, 
hope we'll, we'll see next year. I'm just going to take it as I go. I don't know if I'll be college fishing or I might jump in some BFLs or, or what I'll be doing. But uh, like I say, just this year, just the, just the regional tournament's really the biggest one I got left. You know, the fall isn't really many tournaments for me, at least just, uh, just a couple of regionals or a classic or two. That's about it. Yeah. And the Lake Moomaw thing, how did the weights go in that thing? What, what did it take? Uh, this past weekend, I think it was 11 or 12 pounds. Wasn't much this time of year up there is not a, not a great time to go. If I, you know, if I was talking to somebody and recommending the time to go now would not be the time. Mm-hmm. And it's been taking about, I think it took 12 pounds yesterday. And then our last weekend took 11. That's been kind of consistent about 10, 12 pounds, uh, out of Moomaw. Usually all smallmouth. Some people would bring in a couple large mouth, but this time of year, it seems that you don't really find many big smallmouth. I don't know if it's something to do with the water getting hot or, or the way the shad are offshore or what it is, but um, Moomaw probably won't start to get good till, depending on the winter we have, it should be about end of October, beginning of November when it starts to get starts to get good and you see some bigger fish show up. And I think it's kind of the same with everywhere. I mean, I don't think anywhere right now is really pumping them out, you know, 25 pound bags, but it's kind of like anywhere I, I say here in the next two months or so, you'll start to see the weights come up uh, there for a while. In the Sunday tournaments at Moomaw in the fall, it, it took 20 to 25 pounds to be in the money. So, you know, you just never hear about yeah. it because it's not, it's not a big tournament, yeah. but you know, there is some absolute giant smallmouth in there that most of them probably haven't even been fished for until the recently with Lasco. That's really cool, dude. That's really cool. And then guys, um, you know, please like and subscribe to Corey. We're about to get in debates here and just kind of like what he feels comforted. That's going to be continuing on the Patreon channel. But then again, guys, uh, I'll be dropping a link to everything else that we've been talking about here as well. Uh, please like and subscribe to the channel. Uh, for all the Patreon supporters, uh, you guys can keep watching. If you'd like to be a Patreon supporter, there'll be a link down below so you can watch the rest of this video. We'll see you guys next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.